Let's face it, as a guitarist, you're playing chords 86.8% of the time. And did you know that 32.2% of the time, statistics are made up on the spot? So since you're playing chords most of the time, let's explore some ideas to make your chords more interesting. <laughs> Practicing playing lines is great, but don't forget about working on your chords. Shell voicings are fantastic and are still a vital part of jazz. They leave room for soloists to play whatever they want over your voicings. They work great when backing up a vocalist in a duo setting, for example, because these voicings are clear, concise, the opposite of ambiguous, and don't contain any tension notes that may throw a vocalist off finding their notes. you want to sing to that? With shell voicings, each chord contains the third and the seventh along with either the root or the third in the bass. Simple. That's all you need. Don't equate them with 40s swing. Modern players like Kurt Rosenwinkel use shell voicings in modern creative ways. In a modern approach, simply play three notes of the chord. It doesn't have to only be the root third and fifth or root third and seventh. It can be any combination of those notes. You can even use a voicing that has the ninth or 13th in it. I hope you're digging my content. It would be awesome if you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And if you hit the bell icon, you get notified each time I release another great video with cool ideas on how you can improve as a guitarist. If you're playing with a bass player, leaving the root and the fifth out will make the overall sound between both of you less heavy. Chances are the bassist will likely be playing the root at least I hope the bass player plays the root or the fifth, so you don't need to. These rootless voicings free up fingers to add juicy tension notes to chords to thicken them up. I suggest that you watch this video where I go more in depth about this very topic. I'll make sure I leave a way for you to watch it and to free up your fingers to also play moving lines. This one ties into the last example using rootless voicings, but now let's look at creating simple moving lines as not to distract from the singer or soloist. So here's a line that I want to put inside the chords. Nothing too complicated, just a thread running through the chord progression that's not too busy. Now let's try to hear it with the chords underneath. Planing is cool. It's using the same shape of the chord that you're approaching and then sliding into the chord from below or above, usually in half step motions. It's not much different than approaching target notes when you're playing lines, but now it's with chords. I've got a couple of great videos on how to approach notes. I'll list that for you as well. Now, as you play this, keep in mind that you're using the same shape for each chord. Everything should fall under your fingers. The good thing is, it works great with chord shapes you already know. And don't worry that you're playing quote unquote wrong chords. You're not on these wrong chords for long enough for it to sound wrong. It just adds interest and movement. Now 
that was an example of using a little more on the extreme side. Be careful in most situations not to get too busy. If you coordinate these with the drummer, it can be very dynamic and exciting. It's a cool way to get sort of a off the cuff, big band vibe in a small combo situation. Let's talk about static chords. Static refers to having one chord written for usually more than one measure. In other words, if the chord chart says C major seven for four measures, someone who's maybe just getting started in jazz might think that because it's written out that way that you have to play the same as it looks on paper. C major seven for four measures. Frankly, that's just boring. Let's use the bridge section to rhythm changes as the example to show you at least a few ideas. As you can see here, each dominant seven chord lasts for two measures. One simple approach is to simply play a two five instead of just the dominant seven chord, which you could think of as the five, even though the two chord isn't written in. Remember, all a two chord does is set up a five chord anyway. So it's a win. I win here and I win there. Now what? Winning, winning. Uh-huh. I'll just play the shell voicings from earlier on to keep it simple. You can also play chords that are diatonic to the key that the dominant seven chord originated from. I'm thinking in the key of G for the D7 because D7 is the five chord in G. Here, I'll target each dominant seven chord as if it's the one chord by playing a three, six, two, five for each dominant seven chord. There, you can take it even further and create cycles or sequences. Again, I'm just using diatonic chords from the key that each dominant chord originates. Even the classic down the line with parallel minor seven flat five chords coming down chromatically, which is normally used as an ending, will work. I'm using F sharp minor seven flat five because you can always use a minor seven flat five off of the third of a dominant seven chord as a substitute chord. Now each time you do it, you land on the correct minor seven flat five chord that works on the next dominant seven chord that lasts for two measures and so on and so on. I'll write the original chord changes underneath so you can keep track and see the chords that I'm substituting on top. Let me know in the comments if this lesson was helpful and if you'll be able to implement these ideas. Also, if you have any cool ideas you'd like me to do for future videos, let me know. I've got some more great videos right here for you to check out. These ruthless... ruthless? <laughs> These ruthless voicings?